I know as a portrait painter, I'm kind of a rare breed. I tend to gravitate toward faces and I really enjoy capturing them. But painting portraits can be really frustrating for a lot of artists, whether they're beginners or advanced painters. So I want to talk to you today about why that is. And at the end of the video, I'll talk about what you can do to overcome those hurdles. Before we jump in, if you're new here, by all means, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. And as we walk through, if you find any of this helpful, please hit the like button and leave me a comment to tell me what was helpful to you, because I'd love to hear from you and those comments help me make even better content for you in the future. And if you want to go the extra mile, please feel free to share this with your painting friends. All right, with that out of the way, let's talk about the top four reasons that painting portraits can be such a challenge. Kicking things off is number one, which is you have to have a near perfect drawing. While I find drawing and painting faces much more fun than something exacting like a cityscape that requires super precise perspective, portraiture is often more demanding as far as the drawing goes because you're dealing with the concept of a likeness. In a portrait, it isn't enough to convincingly evoke the idea of just any person, like you can evoke just any building or any landscape in other genres. You're supposed to be evoking a specific person. Further complicating this, as humans, we have a whole separate area of the brain that's solely dedicated to looking at faces. So while the visual cortex lights up just the same way it would when we look at anything else, a separate area of the brain also fires up and starts working when we see faces. So how does that affect painting? As an example, we're pretty good at recognizing a person we've seen before, even better at a person we know well. We can even recognize animals we know. But what about something like a specific pine tree or soccer ball or apple? These items have just as much variation as you or I do. Okay, at least the non-man-made objects do. But we're partially blind to them because they lack faces and we're hardwired to read much further into faces than other kinds of objects. So bringing this back to painting, a drawing has to be almost 100% exact in order for a portrait to accurately capture a likeness. And I can't think of any other subject that's quite that unforgiving. This is why early on in this painting, I adjust my whole block in to enlarge her face. I have to make sure that the drawing was right from the very beginning. Now on to challenge number two, which is literally copying what you see can be surprisingly unflattering. Here's what I mean. It's not that the actual person or even the specific pose or expression isn't flattering. It's that painting is inherently the act of simplifying. And whether you're into photorealism or you want something more painterly, you can't paint every blemish or fluctuation of skin color or variation in texture. You have to omit some of those details. But what happens as we simplify is that we tend to focus on some details to the exclusion of others. And oftentimes this can lead to an unflattering result. For instance, when painting children or women, Including any kind of smile line will almost immediately over-exaggerate that line and make the sitter look much older than they really are. And given that painting is generally reliant on line drawing, it's really easy to put too many lines in and thus create a less than flattering image. This particular portrait was a challenge for exactly that reason. I had to walk a fine line between picking a pose that captured the personality of the sitter, which in this case was entirely bubbly and overflowing with positive energy, and picking a pose that would be natural and easy to paint. In this case, to capture that effervescence, I had to opt for the slightly harder painting. Her smile is so big here, for instance, that there was no way to selectively soften the area where her cheeks meet her mouth. So 
Instead, I thought of this area not as a line, but as two planes to solve this problem of having that kind of hard edge in this painting. The next challenge with painting portraits is that painting skin is not as simple as mixing a bunch of foundation shades. Have you seen the YouTube tutorials where the thumbnail shows a painted face next to a series of generic beige swatches? People really like them because they suggest that just with five pre-mixed colors, you can create this photorealistic portrait. But the truth isn't that simple. Generally, portraits that can get away with that shade range are lit in a very specific way so that no color besides white bounces onto the model's face. That means that they aren't outside or wearing bright clothes or next to anything except for a neutral backdrop that's probably in a photography studio. So what happens if you do want to paint a model outside or next to something bright or in interesting light? Well, you're probably going to have to introduce a lot more color than those beige palettes do. I've had paintings where shadows are purple or gray or blue or green, or the highlights can be even like a blue or bright yellow. Under the right lighting conditions, none of those beige swatches could work in those paintings. And it's not because those colors aren't the same as the colors the model skin. Finally, challenge number four. Painting from models is hard, but painting from photos brings its own problems. When painting children or animals, I generally opt to paint from photos by default because modeling is just plain hard. You'd think that sitting still for a few hours would be about as easy as work can get, but the truth is that we're moving all of the time when we think we're sitting still, and turning that off so that a painter can capture the exact same angle of our face or exact same nuance of our expression is physically really hard. Even the best models will find themselves subject to what's called model drift, where over time, they're holding almost the exact same pose, but just a couple of degrees off so that their muscles can relax just a little bit and they don't start getting cramps. And this doesn't even cover things like hair or fabric that never fold the same way twice once the model gets up to take a break. They're just too complex to ever do the same thing twice. This is why hair and fabric are generally painted in just one session. So when it comes to children or animals, it clearly makes much more sense to opt for photos. On the flip side though, choosing to paint from a photo means you have to deal with the limitations of photography and how that can impact your painting. You see, cameras don't capture color particularly accurately and usually are blind to a lot of the nuance you'd see pretty easily in real life. It usually takes a painter to notice or be bothered by those differences, but it's just one more obstacle for your painting to overcome. Not only that, but in case you haven't noticed, cameras just have one lens, not two, like our eyes do. So they don't see things with the same rounded three-dimensional form that our eyes and brains wind up seeing. This means that photos tend to look flat even if we can look at them and tell that what they were capturing wasn't actually two-dimensional. What this can mean, though, is that painting from photos habitually tends to bring out certain habits in painters. Paintings tend to be more tight and more flat, um, and you tend to over-rely on kind of strange details rather than really effectively learning the most efficient way to suggest a form. So as an example, a friend of mine has a story about getting a portrait critiqued at a famous conference from a master painter. It was a big deal to be selected for the critique, and the critique is done in front of an audience of other painters. The master painter took a look at her work and knew not only that her painting had been done from a photo, the painter also knew that my friend worked most of the time from photos, 
and observed that to get better, my friend would have to stop that practice and begin working from life. Now, this isn't to say that photos aren't an excellent tool or that you can't intersperse them into a practice of painting from life. Sometimes you really have no choice, and sometimes it just makes more sense even if you do have a choice. In other genres, though, like still life or landscape, you can sit in front of your subject and potentially trust that it just won't change if you're painting from life. Sure, a cloud may pass over the sun or the flower you're painting could wilt after a day or so, but in general, you can trust other subjects to be pretty dependable if you do want to get this practice working from life. But with portraiture, you have to hire a model, give them breaks, and learn how to use that limited time with them really effectively. By contrast, you don't have to pay your still life to sit for you. So those are my top four reasons why portrait painting can be an exceptional challenge. The next question is, what can you do to overcome them? Looking at all of these challenges together, I'd say that the best exercises you can do to overcome these hurdles would be to one, when it's time for a study or drawing exercise, focus on developing your drawing skills for accuracy. Two would be to try and think of the face in terms of planes, not lines, to avoid aging your subject. I'll show an example of what I mean by that on the screen. And if you have trouble, painting men can be a bit more forgiving as their faces are a bit less soft than those of women or children, and hard edges or lines won't be quite as disruptive. Number three is don't think of painting skin in terms of painting by numbers and don't rely on paint colors like Caucasian flesh tone as those colors only work in 100% neutral settings. Remember that skin can reflect a whole array of color. And four, try to strike a balance between painting from life and painting from photos. Try to attend group portrait painting sessions and split the model fee. Or if you don't have that option, Set up some still lives or head outside and paint a landscape on location. Balancing these studies from life can help you use photos even more effectively to the point where eventually someone may not even know that you used a photo. So those are my top four exercises for tackling these challenges. But I want to hear from you. Are there any reasons or challenges that you think that I missed or any exercises that you suggest I should include? Let me know in the comments because I'd love to hear from you. And in the meantime, go ahead and subscribe, hit the notification bell, and like this video so that other painters can find this video too. If you're interested in any of the supplies I used to make this painting, I've included links in the description. And if you'd like to commission a portrait like this one, I've included a link to that as well. As always, thank you for watching and happy painting.